Okay, so it is one o'clock. Um, April, can you, there it goes. Maybe it'll let me share my screen now. Okay, Ashley, can you give me a thumbs up if my screen is the one being shared? Perfect. So everybody, welcome. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, some of you stepped outside for lunch, which is amazing because this is spring in Iowa and you never know what you're gonna get. Um, but with spring comes allergies. So I apologize in advance if my voice sounds really husky, more husky than normal or anything. Um, I'm powering through this allergy season. Um, if you haven't done so already, just a few housekeeping things, um, please take a moment to check in to iScore. You can do so by scanning the QR code on the screen by using the Whova app. Um, or if you're in the web browser, you can also, there's a um, conversation that's out there saying, did you check in? And on there is a URL code. Um, so feel free to use one of those methods um, to check in so we can get attendance. Um, you are currently um, logged in to see the College of Engineering Advisors Multimedia Club presentation slash panel. Um, if this was not what you intended on logging into, feel free to pick one of the other sessions. Um, but my name is Mindy Hagen. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I am an academic advisor in mechanical engineering. And I'll let my panelists introduce themselves. Hello, I'm Ashley Morton. I'm an academic advisor in undeclared engineering student services. Welcome. Hello, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, I'm Brad Eilers. I use he, him pronouns and I'm an academic advisor in aerospace engineering. Hey everyone, my name is Brie Kixmiller. I use she, her pronouns and I'm an academic advisor in mechanical engineering. Hi everyone, my name is Nathan Ross. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm also an academic advisor in mechanical And I am Tina Prouty. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an advisor for electrical computer and cybersecurity engineering. I always forget the security part when I put your name out there, Tina. Um, and just so you all know, I did tell the, the panelists while I am going through the next few slides that they can turn their cameras off because when I was working from home, too many cameras at once turned into like bandwidth overload. So as they're popping off, it's nothing personal. They're just trying to save some bandwidth there for to make sure that this comes through clearly as possible. I do want to take a moment to um, acknowledge that the land that we are on, um, Iowa State is located on the ancestral lands and territory of the Bokotsi or Iowa Nation. The United States obtained the land from the Meskwaki and Sauk Nations in the Treaty of 1842. We wish to recognize our obligations to this land and to the people who took care of it, as well as the 17,000 Native people who live in Iowa today. I feel it is also important to have a labor acknowledgement. We must acknowledge that much of what we know of this country today, including its culture, economic growth and development throughout history and across time has been made possible by the labor of enslaved Africans and their ascendants who suffered the horror of the transatlantic trafficking of their people, chattel slavery and Jim Crow. We are indebted to their labor and their sacrifice, and we must acknowledge the tremors of that violence throughout the generations and the resulting impact that can still be felt and witnessed today. So the College of Engineering Academic Advisors Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Multimedia Club um, actually has quite a lengthy history. Um, back in 2017, I was working in the office of the registrar at that time. Um, my supervisor, uh, Dr. Shauna Saad, had created um, opportunities to have discussions around race and ethnicity in the office of the registrar and strongly encouraged us to attend iScore. Um, in 2017, I was able to attend NCORE um, at Dallas Fort Worth and participated in the Professional Development Academy. Um, Japana did speak of the academy this morning. Um, if anybody is going to NCORE, I strongly encourage it. Through the Academy, we really talked a lot about our spheres of influence. Um, so when we came back from Fort Worth with all of this information, 
what can we do with it? Um, we can't just flip a switch and change things. Um, you got to take a step back and actually look at your sphere of influence and start there. Uh, kind of think of it as throwing a rock into some water. Um, it hits the water and then the rings start to come out. Um, so first you've got to dip into the water. At that time, I was uh, really well connected with learning community coordinators across campus and also the spark, um, which is a weekly email um, that Dr. Williams Klotz had facilitated. Um, the spark um, is a story of a student on campus and their real life story about their experience on campus. Um, and it was a great opportunity to connect with learning community coordinators to talk about these stories and think about um, our impacts that we had in our sphere of influence through learning communities. Um, Dr. Sad was doing a great job in the registrar's office at creating opportunities for the full-time staff um, to have these discussions around race and ethnicity. Um, I was supervising student employees, and I felt that one of my spheres of influence could also be the student employees in our office. So I took the principles of community and created a professional development series for the student employees. In 2018, I graduated with my master's degree and switched jobs to mechanical engineering advising. Um, and in this space, there wasn't an area that was having facilitated discussions around um, race and ethnicity and how we can have an impact as advisors in engineering. Um, so I took um, Reasons and uh, Terrazini's college impact theory and Finney's model of ethnic identity and started having conversations with other advisors in engineering. I was fortunate in that I had already created um, a welcoming environment and established connections with a lot of the advisors through my prior role um, through learning communities. And so Reason and Terrazini um, have us evaluate um, people or the students on campus and their scenarios. Um, so what we were doing with each semester, we would have either a book, um, or a movie, maybe soon to be a podcast. And we would evaluate the characters and these stories um, using these models. And how could we as advisors help these students that are working through these challenges and these stories? Um, Finney's model was the one that I used kind of to figure out where the participants were. Um, so Finney has stage one, which is um, a starting to explore your feelings. Um, so where are you as an individual or a participant at in your growth? Um, and then becoming increasingly aware and eventually creating a healthy bicultural identity. The goal of our uh, multimedia club um, is really to improve um, the cultural awareness and being comfortable in uncomfortable conversations. Um, as academic advisors, most of us um, have over 200, 250 advisees. And with those, being we are a predominantly white institution, um, they are predominantly white students, but we have an opportunity to really engage with our multicultural um, students as well. We are one of the few contacts or points at this university that can be a consistent point of contact. Um, academic advisors have the opportunity to meet with students on a regular basis if they choose to do so. Um, our goal was also to learn what to ask and when to ask. So our students know that we see them as whole humans, not just a number. Uh, Cost-wise, this has been a pretty low-cost initiative. Um, we have connected with local libraries to get some of their book club sets, um, where we just checked out an entire set of books, and then we had several weeks to read them before they had to be returned. Um, I want to say the Ames Library gave us the books for eight weeks, um, so it's much more than the, that two-week turnaround. Um, the 1619 project that we did was a free download um, off the internet. 
Um, and then here recently, Dr. Hargrave in the College of Engineering um, has um, assisted with financially covering the movies that we've watched. Um, so there's a lot of free or low cost opportunities out there. Um, so if you're thinking of starting some sort of initiative like this, uh, just know that it doesn't have to be um, a $500, $600 proposal that you have to come up with to the department. A lot of the discussion questions that I found, um, you can find a lot of free discussion questions online, um, but also taking a step back and prepping in advance. Um, as we were watching one of the movies, I was taking notes and totally went off script as far as the discussion guide went and really dug deep into our current situation within uh, College of Engineering and some of the things that we were seeing. I did do an assessment because we this is an education facility, so we got to have assessment and I love assessment. Um, so I did survey the participants to find out what they felt the impact was on them, which they will just um, talk to you all about that here in a minute. Um, but also just kind of sitting back and doing some evaluation of the way the conversations grew. The first semester that we did this, there was eight advisors, counting myself, that participated, and we grew to 14. Um, and so with those that have been with me from the beginning, it has been nice to see the growth of the conversations, the depth of the conversations, um, and the welcomingness of the conversations. So um, just taking some time to step back and see the real impact um, on the participants um, has been really great to see. So these are a list of the um, items that we have read or the films that we have viewed. Um, in case you are wondering, well, what could we be doing? Um, because it is a diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, we don't solely look at racial identity. Um, obviously, we do focus a little more on that than the others. Um, but we have talked about, um, educated by Tara Westover, was about um, a minimalist family and the impact that that had on Tara's education itself. Um, it's a wonderful memoir. Um, but we even covered Native Americans. Um, this spring semester, we're going to be reading through um, disability visibility. Um, so it's going to be discussing um, different abilities and the challenges that sometimes people face um, in the environment that was created for the able-bodied. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I want to give the panelists um, an opportunity um, to share why they chose to participate in this opportunity. So panelists. Okay, I'll get us started since nobody else is speaking. Um, so I am, we discovered that I'm the one that's been with Mindy the longest uh, because I started with her in the, when she was in the registrar's office. And at that time it was mainly to support my friend and colleague in her new initiative that she was doing but then I also was kind of doing it just so I could try to be a better human. Um, I've learned a lot through this process. Um, I've always been a history buff. So I read a lot of history, a lot of memoirs, watched a lot of documentaries, but everything we've been doing through this is showing me those things that I've learned before in a different lens. So it really kind of makes me challenge my beliefs and things like that. And being the introvert that I am, as much as it irritates Mindy, she allows me to internally process for a while before I actually speak up. So that's another great thing. I can go ahead and go next. Um, so I would say I am probably one of the newer members of this group. I just joined this academic year. Um, Mindy had asked me a couple of times in the past to be a part of it. And 
Um, I'll be honest, I have a few small kids at home and taking the additional time or finding the additional time in the evenings to dedicate to readings and stuff like that. I wasn't sure that I'd be able to dedicate the time necessary early on when we started doing this. But when she said that we were going to do more multimedia things this year with like videos and stuff like that, I said, yeah, sure, I'll absolutely take part in it because it's a lot easier for me to fit that in over my lunch hour. Um, but diversity and inclusion is something that's been really important to me. I've tried to be more dedicated to that here in the last like four or five years or so. Um, I think one of the big things that really changed with me is uh, I went to the Nakata National Conference back in 2017, and I kind of tried to step out of my comfort zone by going to a session called uh, Black Lives Matter and Higher Education. And it really put things into perspective for me as a privileged white male in higher education, hearing these different stories and experiences from other people. Um, and I decided that I need to try and be a better, more active advocate for my students and peers and coworkers who are people of color here at Iowa State. So that's why I decided to take part in this. I can go next. Um, Hey everyone, my camera is adjusting, so uh, please bear with me. Um, so I chose to join this group for a couple of reasons. First, I've been with the office since August of 2020. So I started completely virtually. So I, one of the reasons why I joined this group was just a way to get to know some of the other advisors in our college who also have similar ideas, similar wants and desires to learn more about social justice. So the networking for me was an important aspect. I also graduated with my master's in student affairs in May of 2020. So right into the start of the pandemic, yay. Um, and took quite a few social justice classes when I was getting my master's. And so I wanted to continue to learn. Um, I don't think anyone in this group um, would disagree with me when I say that you can't ever be done learning about social justice. There is always more. And so just because I was done with that formal aspect of my education, I wanted to continue to learn. I also knew that at some point in time, I wanted to go back and continue taking graduate classes. Um, I'm currently working on my certificate in education for social justice. And so I also joined this group just to kind of build my academic stamina back up from grad school, giving me an opportunity to read awesome work, continue to learn network, but also to get me back in the habit of taking a class and reading and having discussions and those kinds of things. So those were the main reasons why I chose to join this group. I'll go next, Nathan. Uh, yeah, so I am new to the group. Like Brad, I just joined when we started uh, doing the films, um, watching The Hate You Give and also Just Mercy, but I am not new to this work. Um, I am a longtime advocate and ally for the LGBT community. Um, I do a lot of uh, reading on my own and engaging with conversations about DEI work uh, with others, um, but uh, Bree and I have been paired together this uh, year as part of the Improve You Mentoring Program in the College of Engineering. So we're mentor mentee and we took uh, critical race theory together last semester with Dr. Stewart. It was a fabulous class. I recommend it to everyone who's interested um, in critical race theory or learning more about DEI work. Um, so I was kind of brought in by others, uh, friends I know in the group, and it's been a wonderful experience getting to know people in the college that are also invested and learning more about social justice and DEI work. For, for me, it was an opportunity to get some great directional development. Um, and so, you know, for, for me, I started doing this office in January 2020. Um, so right before we all went sent home. Um, and so there was some, some major life shifts for me with, with that move to this department. And so, you know, financially, things were tight. So, having this be you know, a production development opportunity, you know, where I spend my own time or you know, make a case as a brand new professional, why the department should you know, send me to a conference or something like that, you know, always like to have this opportunity. Um, and then, as Bree mentioned, like, you know, I, I feel like 
we all should be like learned, so like that's what we're going to have to do that. So, you know, this was another way for it to kind of be easy. So panelists, will you share one thing that you've learned? Um, pick one, just one. Um, okay, maybe two. Um, but then also how this has benefited your professional work. I can start about this one. Um, for me, like the biggest impact has been just realizing how whitewashed my education has been, um, especially in you know thinking about your student job education, especially around history. Um, and so, like one of the big big ways for this came from having a meeting in the And so, you know. Growing up and going through school, it was very much, you know, Abraham Lincoln was like, you know, the champion of, of ending slavery. And, you know, we, we talked a lot about the Civil War and how, you know, just kind of the, the general statement of slavery is bad, then enter Abraham Lincoln, and then, then things are better. Yay! Um, and to read through the Sixth Amendment Project and you know, one of the things that really stuck out to me was, yes, Abraham Lincoln had an impact in freeing slaves, but he was not a champion for freeing slaves. And so I actually want to pull up one piece of this. Um, so I'm actually going to read directly from the 1690 project. Um, so like many white Americans, he, Abraham Lincoln, opposed slavery as a cruel system that odds with myth in the field, but he also opposed black equality. He believed that free black people were a, quote, troublesome presence incompatible with the democracy intended only for white people. And so, you know, the, the article continues on about how he actually brought um, five, you know, well-esteemed free slaves to the White House to talk about how he and Congress had had made this agreement to basically ship ship free slaves off to another country because they they could be free. Um, and so for me, it was just really remarkable to to see how you know in my K through twelve education, you know, it was when Lincoln was put on this pedestal as like this this champion for for black people, and yet. You know, going through the system and being like, no, not really. That was really whitewashed to to show him as like a white savior. Um, so that that's just like one of the things that really stuck out to me. can go ahead and go next. Um, so again, I've only been a part of this for a little over a semester so far. And so I've just watched the two videos that we did last semester, which was the hate you give and just mercy. And again, I think they've both just been really eye opening. And again, just in me needing to acknowledge my privilege as a white able bodied male, um, and trying to be more cognizant of that and more open minded, um, and really just applying that to my job and how I work with students and trying to remember how can I apply this as an academic advisor? Um, how would I deal with this if one of my students was going through a situation like something that we experienced in one of these movies? What would I do? Who would I get them connected to on campus or in the Ames community? Um, so just trying to do that deeper dive into things of how can I apply this to my job or in my everyday life in general? Um, and how can this be applied in different ways? I can go next. Um, so mine is very broad of what I've learned. I've been in this group. Um, let's see, I started with 1619 Project. So I've been on for 1619 Project and then our last two movies. Um, something that I've learned is that there are other people in the College of Engineering that are interested in learning about social justice which might sound really simplistic, but coming out of my master's program where we were having these really hard hitting conversations at least once a week, if not multiple times a week, 
I was worried that transitioning out of that, that I would lose kind of this community to have some of those discussions with. So being able to find other people and it's more than just us six, there's this whole community that we get together and talk. Um, and so having that space is great. Um, this actually transitions into my, how, how do I use this? What do I benefit from this? Is I know that I have a group of people who are quote unquote safe people to talk to about some of these things. For example, last week I had a meeting with one of my students and we were having some pretty deep social justice related conversations in this one-on-one -on -one meeting. And I then went and talked to that issue talked to Nathan about that issue and then Mindy about that issue and then Ashley about that issue because I know that those were people who as advisors could understand the, the situation I was in but also were in this space where I knew they were interested in helping me in relation to this social justice issue. So it's been really helpful for me to have that circle. It's kind of nebulous. People kind of come and go depending on the semester and the project but it's nice knowing that, oh yeah, I have this group of people that I can talk to about these issues and be comfortable with that. I'll go next. Um, so like Brad said, I've been here for a couple of the films. Uh, everything that I've learned from the group so far, it's, it's kind of echoing what Bree said, is that there's a, a network of people I know I can engage with and talk to. Um, but not only am I learning how to apply this to my students, but also my colleagues, it feels like once a month we hear about a person of color leaving Iowa State. Um, is So I know that there's a need to support each other as staff members and faculty members as well. And it's we focus a lot on the students, but I do try to make an effort to reach out to my colleagues of color and just kind of let them know I'm here. I'm someone they can talk to. I care about them. I want to hear their stories. Um, so just kind of supporting those staff members around me as well. And similar to what everybody's been saying, um, I know that I have this group that I can talk to and learn from. Um, I've also learned that I need to question everything I've ever been taught um, and everything that I currently see because there's so much misinformation out there and whitewashed information that you have to look at different sources to learn different things because the things I've learned in the 1619 project and in an indigenous, sorry, an indigenous people's history, history. of the United States. Yes, um, that one was very eye-opening. So, and so it's really made me challenge a lot of my beliefs, but yet I've had this safe space where I can talk to others who it's also challenged some of their beliefs and what they've been taught. And then the added bonus is we can all kind of talk about how do we want to use this information going forward with our students, with our colleagues, and things like that. And we know we're not going to be judged for our thoughts and what some of our approaches may be. So the last question I have for our panelists, and then we will open it up for questions um, from the audience. Um, how do you apply what we've uncovered during all of this? You've kind of dabbled a little bit in it, um, but if you want to just briefly cover, um, discuss how you apply what we've uncovered in our discussions. And then um, attendees, if you have questions, please use the Zoom chat. That's how we will be asking questions today. For me, I'm, I'm really focusing on how I can share what I've been doing. And so, even being a panelist here um, has, has been an intentional step in, in that for me because this, this is not a, a comfortable thing to present. Um, and so, you know, for me, I'm, I'm trying to be intentional to those steps to, to really share. You know, share what I've been learning um, and really trying to encourage other people to, to listen to the other.
I feel like being a part of these conversations has made me more aware of what's going on in the world. Um, it also has allowed for me to try to understand uh, where people are coming from and what they may be experiencing. Uh, one lesson I definitely have learned is to believe people and believe their stories and understand that their experience may be very different from mine in the world as a white woman. Um, so that's something I, I try to apply to conversations with students and just in my personal life as well with anyone I'm engaging with. So for me, um, I feel like I've always been an open, honest, good listener and person to go to um, and pretty empathetic, but this has given me just one other layer to all that. So I slightly may understand, but I'm never gonna understand the struggles that my students have gone through. So just being more open to listening to them and being able to hopefully be that person that they can come to if they need it or get them to the right resources um, so that I can better serve them. And I would say for me, um, definitely like what Ashley and the others have touched on, just doing a better job of listening and being more open-minded. And again, um, I think Tina may have touched on this earlier, just like with all the misinformation out there, making sure that you're listening to what's being said and being able to sort out the difference between what's the truth and what's not the truth. Um, but also being able to apply this to our department here in aerospace specifically. Um, we are predominantly white male students in our department, as is the case with a lot of the engineering disciplines, and trying to create more safe spaces for our students of color, um, being better advocates for them, things like that. So trying to implement what we're learning in this group and tying it back to our students again. <laughs> yeah, I mirror pretty much what everyone else has already said. Um, I can't think of a specific time where it's like, yep, I took that nugget of information I learned in our book club and I had directly applied it in this one situation because I believe that social justice, it's just one more tool in your toolkit. Once you know about something, you're going to see it, you're going to recognize it, um, especially as a white woman, um, recognizing where maybe my voice needs to step back and recognizing where my voice needs to step forward and just being able to take what is around me and apply everything that I've learned related to social justice, whether it was in a class or it was in book club or something that I read or some discussion that we had as a group, being able to take that and applying it to whatever situation I'm in, um, that social justice work should be reflexive of the situations that we're in and the world that we're in. Thank you. So this is where we open it up for live questions um, from the audience. If you could again throw them into the Zoom chat. Um, I can't find the Whova chat. Hopefully Bree can still find that. If, if, if not, we'll figure it out. But otherwise, if you could use the Zoom chat, that would be great. Um, one of the questions that came in was, what is the challenge of facilitating this? Um, one of the challenges, they're all pretty extrovert or introverted. Um, the group is very introverted. I'm an extreme extrovert. And so I know as introverts, they need time to process. So literally, sometimes I ask a question and then count to 20 in my head. And usually by the time I get to 15, 16, somebody is speaking. Very rarely do I ever make it to 20. Um, but allowing them the time that they need, um, because not everybody is like me, where we just could talk all day um, and process out loud. Another challenge is we all do this on top of our daily tasks. Um, and so with facilitating, it is a challenge in coming up with a book or a movie, finding access to it for everybody, scheduling a room, scheduling time um, to, to make this happen. But it is so important that 14 of us have given up our lunch hours to make this happen. And it's not just one lunch hour, it is several. Um, we typically meet four to six weeks straight 
um, on a specific day of the week. So they're giving up a lot of their personal time. Um, and we are now evaluating um, taking it out of the workday instead, because do we need to be taking it out of our personal time when this directly applies to work? Um, so yes, um, that is a challenge. Um, I would say that's a challenge as a participant as well, um, because we, you know, we have this the set amount of time that that we can devote over our work hour to this work, and you know, we, we at least I feel like we just get the discussion going, and then we have to stop because there is a class coming into the classroom. Um, so I think that's a that's a challenge as a participant as well. That's you know, how, how do you devote enough time to actually and I jump off of that also as a challenge of having it in general during the workday is we might be having this really intense in-depth discussion about who knows what and then the meeting ends and we have to go directly into a student meeting or for some of us specifically me my lunch break is like my me time like do not open my door when I am at lunch and so having to take my one hour a day where I know I can just sit on Facebook and scroll through Instagram and take my time and having to devote that to something that is academic sometimes can be really draining on some of those days because I'm not getting that break. So what I've started doing is blocking at least the half hour, if not the hour immediately after we have these discussions. One, so that if they go long, which sometimes they do, um, I'm not running to a student appointment or I'm not running late for something, but also giving myself time to still decompress. Um, I recognize during registration season and some of these more busy seasons, that might not always be possible, um, but to still try to find some way to counterbalance really the emotional toll that some of these discussions have with like being self-responsible at the same time. So um, next question that came in was, how comfortable are you in asking questions in a group like this? And what makes it comfortable or uncomfortable? Yeah, I can go ahead and go first on this. Um, I think Mindy has done a really good job as the moderator of making it feel like a safe space. I also think it helps that our group is made up entirely of other academic advisors in the College of Engineering. So I feel like we have a lot of common experiences, at least here in the workplace, um, and a lot of like similar educational backgrounds and stuff like that. Um, a lot of us have gone through like higher ed programs and things. So I feel very comfortable. These are all people that I have known and worked with for multiple years here. So again, I think having a good moderator like Mindy, um, sometimes keeping us on task, but also having good discussion questions, but then also just having a good group of coworkers um, really helps with the discussion aspect and the comfort level of asking questions. Yeah, kind of like what Brad said, since we all work together, know each other, know that um, we're not going to judge each other if we ask a question that others might be like, oh, why is she asking that question? Um, we know that it's a space to learn. So everybody, and especially Mindy, makes it very comfortable. Or if for some reason, if we're not comfortable, we know we can talk to someone from the group outside of the group and say, well, I really wanted to ask this question and then maybe get some others in on it too. If, if you're not super comfortable within the group, but most of the time that's really not an issue. Well, I want y'all to judge me. I'm just going to say that because if I say something that deserves judgment, I want you to call me out on it because when you're uncomfortable, I feel like that's when you're learning. So I, I feel like that's why I'm showing up. That's why I'm coming to this is because I don't want to just say the same story I've always said. I don't want to be just going along with what the group says. So 
I'm giving all of you in this group permission. Please call me out if I say anything that you feel like would be a good learning moment for me, okay? I'll call you out, but I'm not going to judge you. Yeah, sure. I think it helps that you know, with this group, all of us are optimal. And so there is that mutual buy-in to like, what we're doing and the recognition that this is this is important for us to do as, as individuals and it's going to help us individually as, as a group, as a department, as a university, as society. And so I think there is that, that buy-in. I have a two part answer to this. So we'll see if I remember the second part when I'm done talking about the first part. Um, so for me, especially since I haven't worked in the office as long or I haven't worked in the college as long is I know that first like meeting, I really had to kind of test the waters and see like, okay, where, where are we all at with this? Cause I didn't want to say something that was so outrageous and then have to backpedal. And I never really felt that. Like when someone new comes into the group, I do feel like I need to kind of scope out like, okay, where are they at with their understandings of all of this? How does my, my learning align or not align? Um, but as time goes on and we get to know each other better, it's definitely easier to put my guard down. Um, and then part two of that, which I did remember, which I'm proud of myself for remembering part two, um, is that I tend to talk my ideas out loud. So if I'm sitting in a space and I'm wrestling with something, wrestling with it internally doesn't help me. I need to just say whatever I'm thinking of. And if it comes to a conclusion, that's great. And so I love having this space where I hope that the group is okay with me doing that. It's like, I'm just going to verbally vomit here for a minute because this is what I'm thinking and I'm not quite sure where I'm at with my learning on this, but here's where I'm at and being able to get feedback as a group is really helpful. Um, so over time, I've definitely gotten more comfortable, especially as I've gotten to know people. Um, my first meeting with some of these people was the first time I had actually met some of these people being a new employee. So as I've gotten more comfortable, it's definitely gotten easier to ask questions and um, talk about things that they aren't, we're, these conversations aren't meant to be easy. They're not meant to be comfortable. If they're comfortable, we, why are we talking about them? So it's important that we have that space. Well, and acknowledging also that that is a privilege to choose comfort, you know, that is not something that everyone on this campus can experience, you know, um, that is part of white privilege is that I can choose whether or not I want to be uncomfortable and engage in these conversations or just not go there, because uh, this is a predominantly white institution. So um, I think leaning into that discomfort is something that is something I know that is a privilege of mine that I, I am making a choice to engage in that. Um, and it's also, it's also when I know I'm learning. Um, when I feel uncomfortable, as it, it usually is a signal to me that that is something I need to explore and, and work on more because why am I feeling uncomfortable? And as a facilitator, um... Honestly, I try to make it a brave space, not a safe space. Um, I intentionally try to make them uncomfortable um, because like Ashley said, that's usually when the learning happens. Um, and I think at one point in time, we've all said something that we're like, ooh, that landed wrong. Um, but I was brave enough to say it, learn from it, and try not to make that mistake again. Um, so that's some of the, the big things with the space. Um, we do have ground rules. Um, you know, what is shared as far as the stories go, stay in there. So if anybody shares a personal experience, the lessons learned go, uh, follow us, but the stories stay. Um, and everybody has so far respected that greatly. So it's, it's been um, a great thing. Um, it looks like we've got five minutes left. Uh, Dr. Ann Card, thanks for the shout out. Yes, Rosalie, extroverts are great, but we do have to count. Um, another question, is there a reason you have to do these discuss discussions over the lunch hour? Seems directly related to the position. Yeah, so that's the time we all can get together. Um, it was the time when I started this that everybody had open on their calendars. 
um, the feedback from the group is this is professional development. And also we have dug into some really deep, heavy conversations where high emotion and then had to go talk to a prospective student family and be all giddy. That I am extroverted and that was hard for me. So I cannot imagine how that was for all of the participants. So we are looking at creating time and getting buy-in from um, the department chairs, et cetera, to start doing this during the day, during our normal time, not necessarily our lunch time. So I appreciate um, the thought there, Amanda. And yes, that is something that we are transitioning to because it is professional development. Uh, so we've got five minutes left. Is there another question in here? Uh, what is, if you had to say one book or topic that we um, discussed in this group, um, what is one that you feel everyone should do? Um, and I know a couple of you have only done the movies, but um, thinking through all of your social justice readings, et cetera, if there's a book or a movie that you think everybody needs to watch, read, et cetera, what would that be? We've read a lot of books. I mean, definitely, I mean, I have to say almost all of them, Nickel Boys, Educated, um, an Indigenous People's History to, of the United States. I mean, that one was great. So I don't think there's been a bad book yet. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I'm like, so I, I started with the 1619 Project and then watched those movies. And I strongly recommend all three. I think with, with each, they challenge me in different ways. And really, again, challenge with you know those those previously held beliefs and and you know quote unquote truths from my perspective. That's like, no, this isn't a universal truth. It's different for different people. Um, so, like for example, in in the Haiti Um one of the pieces of that that we really hit home was the the father talking with his children about how to how to interact with the apes. And it was very much a, this is what you do so that you don't die during a traffic stop. Um, you know, and that was not my experience at all. You know, my conversation with my parents about police was very much, a, you know, if you're in trouble, the police are here for you and they're, they're here to help and you seek them out. Not a, this is what you do if you encounter these people so that you say, and so, you know, with all of these, I would say, you know, very impactful and definitely challenges, you know, what people don't tend to say how good it is to quickly talk education. Um, this wasn't a part of this book club, but in the Injuring Student Services Office, we read So You Want to Talk About Race. Uh, shout out to Santos Nunez for recommending this book. Um, I like this one better than White Fragility. And I feel like that's a book everyone should read. And um, I also love The Hate You Give. It's kind of a long book. So another book that's similar to it is Dear Martin. If you have not read Dear Martin, I highly recommend that one as well. So I've been in this group for 1619 Project, The Hate You Give, and Just Mercy. Yet again, recommend all of them. I don't think anything that I've been a part of has not been worth the time. I personally would recommend, though, I think everyone needs to read the 1619 Project. Um, the amount of learning that I got out of that as, um, and it's it's written in like magazine short story format. So you don't need to sit down and read a 300 page novel. You can just kind of read snippets as you go, um, especially right now with lots of talk about books being banned. I think all of us need to have a bit of a rebellious side right now and you need to read the books that are being banned. And 1619 Project has had a lot of discussion around it. And as you read it, you realize kind of why. Um, so I advocate for all of them but I think everyone needs to get their hands on a copy of the 1619 Project, which it's free to read online. So there's really no excuse to not have access to it if it's something that you're interested in reading. 
Yeah, and again, with me being a newer member to the group, um, just a couple additional resources that I've really liked outside of the two movies that we've done. Um, I really liked the documentary 13th on Netflix. Um, I would strongly recommend that to anyone who has not seen it. And then also, as far as a book goes, um, I read Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man uh, last year. Really easy read, really quick read. I read that in like two days. So that's another good starting point too, I feel like for anyone looking to get into this. And Aaron, the librarian gave us a big shout out that yes, we need to read banned books. And I want that as a t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody that logged in. Um, I know not everybody had a chance to answer that last question, but we are at time. And so I want to respect everybody's time um, and allow for the break before the next session begins. If you have any questions about our initiative, what we have done or looking for ideas, feel free to reach out to us. Um, if it is something that one of the panelists can answer, they'll definitely reach out to me to get you connected with um, some ideas. But um, it's great work. It's hard work. It is necessary work. So we hope you all join us in continuing the work and making the work grow. Um, again, we all want to thank you for your time today. Did we need to put the QR code up, Mindy? Oh, for the session evaluation?